Welcome to Electrified. My name is Dylan Loomis, and in this episode, we'll dive into the data that basically refutes all of our dear friend Gordon Johnson's points in the recent Tesla Daily and Gordon Johnson Tesla debate. Just in case anybody missed the debate, I did link the full episode in the description below. I wanna give a quick big shout out to Rob for maintaining his class and poise throughout the whole interview despite being interrupted on countless occasions. I knew that he would as he is a class A professional, but even still, there were times I know he was frustrated and any human would be because after watching the debate a second time, he really had very few chances to actually speak and think through his full thought. But all of that aside, I really believe this is one of the most important videos I will have made to date. Being able to understand these specific financial metrics and delivery trends that we will cover is super important when it comes to being able to speak intelligently when bears or people that don't yet understand Tesla bring up these points. And it goes without saying, but as Tesla investors, understanding this information is foundational. So without further ado, let's get into the big facts only. So let's start by talking about how Gordon kept saying Tesla's fundamental business was losing a ton of money. As we know, that fundamental business is automotive. So I pulled the automotive specific data from Tesla's financials. On the left, we have auto revenue, excluding the energy revenue. We have a line item for regulatory credits, and then total auto revenue cost is just the cost of goods sold. So this number is how much it costs Tesla to earn these revenues, these are in millions, by the way, so 4,360 means 4.3 billion. Gross auto profit is just the auto revenues minus the cost of revenues, and then I did break out another line item without regulatory credits. Moving down into operating expenses, Tesla breaks this up into three divisions, research and development, selling general and administrative, and restructuring and other. Primarily, these numbers come from the first two as the restructuring and other has been essentially zero for most of the last few quarters. So what I did, since Tesla reports these numbers for both their auto and energy sector, I took an 80% rate to be applicable to the auto division specifically. If you guys think this number is too high or too low, please let me know below but I think it seems reasonable that 80% of their operating expenses are attributable to their auto business, at least as of today. Moving down the sheet, we have the fundamental auto income or loss with the regulatory credits is this line right here. And then we have these same figures without the regulatory credits included. So as you can see very clearly, even without regulatory credits, Tesla's fundamental business of making vehicles is indeed making money. It's been over $100 million for every quarter except Q2 of 2019. So anytime someone comes to you and tries to argue that every car Tesla sells loses money or Tesla's fundamental business is a money loser, you can take a screenshot of this screen and show it to them that that is indeed factually incorrect. Tesla is not losing money on their vehicle business. As you can see from this chart, they do indeed make money from making vehicles. Boom, roasted. And now before we move on, if you still have any bare arguments, even looking at this data, please share them below. I would love to consider them and potentially dive a little bit deeper into a counterpoint to further arguments from this set of data. And of course, if there's anything that you believe I missed or anything that should be added, let me know as well. Moving into Gordon's next main argument was that Tesla's European market share was cratering over the last few months. So we're gonna take a look and explain why it's not a big deal. So this is the European sales data for the last five years, broken down by month. The green rows are essentially the third month of each quarter, and this is important to note because Tesla makes all vehicles for the European market in Fremont. Obviously, they don't yet have a Gigafactory in Europe, so that's where the cars have been coming from. If you didn't know, basically in the first two months of the quarter, they make cars primarily for the European market, Toward the end of the second month, they then ship the cars to Europe to then be delivered in the final month of the quarter. So as you can see in March, June, September, and December, the third month of each quarter, 
the delivery figures are significantly higher than the first two months of the quarter. So using that information, Gordon kept saying how from the end of 2019 or Q4 into now, midway through 2020, that the market share has been cratering. Well, that brings us right to the red. Fremont, where they make the cars for Europe, was shut down for roughly eight weeks. So partially in March, all of April, and partially in May. So that is a huge chunk of when Tesla makes cars for their June deliveries in Europe, which they were not able to do. And as Rob said in the debate, Tesla does not keep inventory on hand like other automakers. It's very slim, so when your factory is shut down, you don't have any cars to sell to this market. And a quick aside, anytime somebody starts breaking down Germany sales data or anything more minute than Europe as a whole, you need to keep in mind, that's like talking about Montana sales data in the United States. Overall, it's not going to move the needle and there are just fluctuations that aren't good indicators and this is where we can talk about cherry picking actual data. Germany is literally the actual size very close to Montana and so who really cares what's going on specifically in Germany? Let's just zoom out, look at the bigger picture and these macro trends because ultimately that's going to tell the story the best. If a bear came to you and said, oh, Tesla only sold X amount of cars in Montana. Well, okay, BFD, you know what I mean? Like, let's look at US as a whole because those are the trends that actually matter. And I will say there is much more legitimate competition in the EV space in Europe. However, I know a lot of people are waiting for the Model Y to be built at Giga Berlin. It's set to come online sometime here in 2021. With all the new manufacturing advancements, I know plenty of people are excited for this vehicle and they prefer the Model Y to the Model 3. So there is in a sense an Osborne effect of some Europeans at least waiting to buy the Model Y from Giga Berlin. And so when you consider the potential Osborne effect of Giga Berlin and the Fremont factory being shut down and there being new EVs for sale in the European market with great incentives, it's not hard to explain why the market share has changed over the last few months. However, moving forward, I don't think the main driver of the decreased market share has that much to do with the competition. I think it's primarily the Fremont shutdown, there just wasn't enough supply, and people waiting for Giga Berlin to come online to buy a Tesla. Teslas produced locally will cost less than Teslas produced in Fremont for Europe. <laughs> it's very simple. So. I think we just need to be patient, let Fremont come back online, let Giga Berlin be up and running, and then we'll take a look at the market share in Europe. And so at least for now, this is absolutely not a reason to panic. So anytime someone brings up Tesla's market share in Europe is cratering, go ahead once again, screenshot this page, explain the Fremont factory, explain Giga Berlin coming online and the Osborne effect, etc. This is absolutely not a valid bear argument to try and claim that the growth story has peaked and the growth story is over. This is debunked. Boom, roasted. Shifting gears to one semi-valid point that Gordon made, so just bear with me on this one and hear me out and then feel free to respond below. He kept saying that Tesla's sales had peaked in Q4 of 2018. Obviously, this is just blasphemy when you consider the future and what we will see here in the back half of 2020, but let's just look at the past looking data. In this chart, Q4 2018, they did 6.3 billion in revenue. And as you can see in the ensuing months, only Q4 of 2019 just barely edged out the revenue number for Q4 2018. And these cars are not arbitrary. I placed the Model 3 here as it came online in Q2 2017, and the Model Y, as we knew, came online Q1 of this year. But what Gordon was arguing is that in a hyper growth phase for the revenue to essentially remain flat quarter over quarter is not good. And I think an easy explanation or at least on a very simple level is that with more Model 3 sales, the average sale price and the total revenue will decrease relative to selling Model S and Model X. However, Model S and Model X were still for sale and with the addition of the Model 3 ramping, the revenues remained flat over the course of the year. So I'm actually really curious on this one. If someone were to come to you and say, why did Tesla sales remain flat from Q4 2018 to Q4 2019? 
What would you argue? And I'll say it again. I am not in any way saying that he was right in saying that this is a debunk girl's story or that the sales have peaked because that's just insane. But for this very specific window, it's a valid argument to wonder why didn't the sales increase from Q4 2018 to Q4 2019? And yes, in Q4 2020, Tesla's sales revenue figures will blow this away, in my opinion, for obvious reasons. But just looking at this specific window, what would you guys say? And just in case someone tried to argue that the sales volume decrease in terms of vehicles, you can show them this chart. It's just not true. Quarter 4, 2018, Tesla delivered over 90,000 vehicles. And as you can see, they have already had three quarters in 2019 beat the Q4 18 numbers. So the only argument they could even try to make is with regard to the revenue figures, not actual sales volume. And these random numbers down here, this is basically halfway through the year. So 2019, halfway through, they have sold 158,000 units. Over here in 2020, so far, they've sold 179,000. As we know, Tesla has guided for selling half a million vehicle units this year, which they reaffirmed in their Q2 data. That being said, they need to sell 320,000 vehicles in Q3 and Q4 total to hit that 500,000 sales figure number, which would be an average of 160,000 vehicles per quarter, which clearly would be their best quarters to date. And they have a very clear path to do so with Giga Shanghai and Fremont. And a few other closing points. So the statement he made about Tesla being like AOL is obviously insane. And his claim was that Tesla has no technological advantage. As anybody that knows the first thing about Tesla knows, this is actually blasphemy and really crushes Gordon's credibility on all levels. But specifically, he kept talking about how anybody can go buy batteries from these suppliers and anybody can get the same cells that Tesla gets. While right now, and historically, that's been true, the special sauce is in the BMS or the battery management system. So, okay, if companies can buy these individual cells, they then have to put them together and have the cooling and all of the technology and the software that goes into putting these cells into packs putting the pack into the car, and then integrating it with the actual drivetrain. So that's all Tesla. Tesla is not buying the BMS from any of these companies, CATL, Panasonic, LG. They do that on their own. So that is indeed proprietary technology that is clearly destroying everybody else because if other automakers are indeed buying those same cells, their ranges aren't even close to what Tesla is doing. So where is that range discrepancy coming from? Of course, I'm sure Rob would have pushed Gordon on this had he given him a chance to speak, but it just, it doesn't make any sense. Obviously, Tesla has an advantage. They are destroying people when it comes to EPA ranges and efficiency. And obviously, we could go on and on about technological advances, but just what he was talking about, the batteries, even there, he's wrong. Boom. Roasted. I also loved the point Rob tried to make with the full self-driving argument. Gordon was obviously hammering this, talking about the people that have died. And he said, even if one person dies, you, you just shouldn't have it. It's not worth it. And Rob wisely tried to ask him a hypothetical question by saying, if one person has to die to save 10 people, would it be worth it? And Gordon kept ducking the question and saying, oh, I would never use full self-driving. If I was riding in the car with somebody with full self-driving, I would have them let me get out on the freeway. So, okay, dude, whatever, that's fine. But that out of the question, he wouldn't even ans answer the hypothetical. And this is going to be crucial in the coming years as full self-driving becomes more and more of a thing because the unfortunate truth is some people will die using this technology, whether it's their fault or Tesla's, most of the time it will be their fault. People will die, but Elon has said, this is part of advancing into a future where millions of lives are saved. If you didn't know, over 1 million people die every year in auto accidents. So the argument is very clear. If full self-driving can eventually save hundreds of thousands of lives and in the process, a few or a few hundred or even a few thousand lives are quote unquote sacrificed to achieve this future, is it worth it? Mathematically, it's a very clear yes, and I don't want to make this sound like I'm making death a small thing. Obviously, it is not, but what I'm getting at is if people use the technology properly, 
most of the time, if not all of the time, there won't be these sacrificial deaths. And just the fact that Gordon has never used it very clearly shows that he can't actually know what he's talking about if he's never seen the technology used. I think this goes for a lot of people. If, if they were to just be in a car and watch autopilot work how it's supposed to work on a highway and how easy it makes your commute, just like a lane keep assist does, people would begin to see the power of full self-driving. And then if they knew what was going on behind the scenes in shadow mode and how close it actually is to a level of autonomy that the public is definitely not ready for, the game would be different. Gordon also kept mentioning how Tesla has cut the prices of the vehicles and the sales have still stagnated, you know, etc. Well, a couple of things. So Tesla is cutting prices to make the vehicles cheaper to be more affordable for a wider segment of the market. And guys, anytime anybody starts arguing about Tesla and profitability, just simply remind them, Tesla is not ultimately focused on profitability. It's the most basic thing for anybody that understands Tesla's mission and yet no one else is understanding this seemingly on Wall Street. If Tesla was just trying to make the most profit, they could post ridiculous numbers and I'm confident of that even without massive scale to date. But they are far more focused on transitioning the world to sustainable energy and they're doing that by building out factories and by providing as much value to the end customer as they can while being slightly profitable. Elon has said that numerous times. So all of Wall Street is looking at numbers, expecting huge profitability numbers when Tesla isn't even that focused on profitability. Of course, it's a consideration, but they have far bigger goals and they have levers that they can pull. So when the EV credits go away, they can do simple things, whether it's research and development, whether it's scaling back gigafactory buildouts, they have things they can do to maintain profit levels slightly positive, which is their goal. Elon just said on the Q2 conference call, he's still frustrated with how expensive the cost of Teslas are. So you better believe that Tesla will continue to cut prices each time they can until the cars are affordable for as many people as possible. So I could honestly go on and on, but I don't want to make this episode too long and I could obviously do another episode down the line, but please let me know how you guys are thinking about that debate. If you learned anything in this episode, if you think any of my takes are wrong or accurate, uh, I would love to hear your feedback. As always, I'm genuinely curious. Please take a second to like this episode if you learned anything new or got any value and consider subscribing for more Tesla content. You can check out our Patreon to support us further. But I thank you guys for watching this long. I do very much appreciate all of you. I hope you have an excellent Labor Day holiday and I will see you in the next episode.